Hare Krishna. The culture of devotional service to the Lord is just so nice. We just got a glimpse of it with this little dance performance and the song. Imagine a culture where people are completely immersed in the glorification and the service of the Lord. Then the material world will actually become the spiritual world. And everyone will forget their own miseries and problems. And this is the only way to do that. The only effective and sustainable remedy for all the miseries of life, for all the problems of life. To engage in hearing and chanting about the Lord and to serve Him in various other ways. That is one of the very important reasons for the Lord's descent into this world. He provides us subject matter to hear and chant about. Otherwise, what would we discuss? Only materialistic topics. And even for those who were somewhat spiritually inclined, they would resort to philosophical speculation, impersonal, absolute truth, which goes on largely even now. So you can imagine what would have happened if the Lord had not advented Himself and performed so many pastimes. These pastimes are meant for attracting the conditioned souls who are engrossed in worldly affairs. By displaying these most nectarian pastimes on the surface of the earth, the Lord wins the hearts of the devotees and makes them attracted to Him. Anugrahaya bhakta na manusham tanmashritam So it is only for the sake of bestowing mercy upon the devotees does the Lord descend. Bhajate tadrashi krida And therefore He engages in all these beautiful pastimes. Yahashrutva tat paro bhaved And when we hear these pastimes, then we should automatically develop love for Him. That is a natural consequence of hearing faithfully the pastimes of the Lord. So now, leading up to Ram Navmi, we've been having a series of talks on Lord Ram and his devotees. Yesterday we were speaking about the two brothers, Sugriva and Vali, before that, we had spoken about two other brothers, Jatayu and Sampati. And we won't have time for discussing many other sets of brothers and sisters in the Ramayana. <laughs> Maybe some other time. So, you know, Ramayana and the Lord's pastimes in general are sometimes controversial because people who are not acquainted with the philosophy and the science of devotional service, who lack faith and understanding, they try to find fault in the Lord's pastimes and His actions and His messages. And they attribute wrong motives to Him. And they try to superimpose certain moral ideas that are supposed to be followed by us as humans upon the Supreme Lord, unaware of the transcendental supreme position of the Lord and that He is not subject to the kind of rules and norms that we are subject to. So also in the case of killing of Vali, it is one of those quote-unquote controversial passages in the Ramayana. There are a few others like that. And typically you might find those who wish to criticize the Lord will bring up such pastimes. Why did the Lord do this? How could He do that? Vali was fighting with his brother, Sugriva. And Ram was hiding behind the bushes and he shot an arrow and killed Vali. 
So we, ha- we heard yesterday the brief history of the conflict between Vali and Sugriva. And since Vali had banished Sugriva, his younger brother, from the kingdom because of a misunderstanding, he had also taken away Sugriva's wife. And now Sugriva was living on Rishamukha mountain protected by the curse of Matanga Rishi upon Vali. So Vali didn't dare to enter into into that area. Then as we know, Lord Ram struck a pact of friendship with Sugriva and he said, I will help you to regain your kingdom and your wife and you help me to regain my wife. So then a sacred fire was lit and a friendship was formed. When Ram said to Sugriva, I will kill Vali today, he didn't delay at all. He said, immediately go and challenge him. The first time Sugriva was getting thoroughly beaten and he had to flee and Ram didn't shoot an arrow. And when Sugriva asked him, he explained that I could not distinguish between you two because you were looking identical. And he said, anyway, go again. And there was some distinguishing mark that he had this time. And this time Lord Ram didn't fail. He shot the arrow. And it struck Vali. Lord Ram's arrow never fails. You know, in Sanskrit there is a proverb, Ram Ban Upai. Upai means a solution. Ram, Ram, Ban, Ban means the arrow. So when you want to say that here is a remedy or a solution that is unfailing, that will definitely be successful, you say, oh, this is a Ram, Ban, Upai. Sometimes you see you have a problem, a a medical ailment, someone gives you medicine, this is a Ram, Ban, Upai, take it. (laughs) Meaning that this medicine will not fail. It will cure your ailment. So Lord Ram's arrows always meet their target. They always fulfill their intended purpose. So here it was with Vali as well. How could any arrow discharged by Lord Ram be unsuccessful? So Vali was hit there. The question may be asked, and something to this effect was also asked yesterday, in the question-answer session. How is it that Lord Ram got confused? He didn't know. How is it that Lord Ram didn't know where Sita was, where Ravan was? Yes, this question was there. It's a natural question that comes to people's minds. And the answer is that this is the Lord's pastime. He has come here to enact pastimes within the human species and he has come for the fulfillment of many purposes. And also when the Lord performs pastimes here, he gets so absorbed in the mood of that role that he's playing that he actually forgets. It's not just that he does a drama and in the drama he's play acting. Yes, it is a kind of a drama. It is a transcendental drama enacted by the Lord on the platform of the earth But by his Leela Shakti, his pastime potency, his knowledge of his own godhood and omnipotency is sometimes clouded so that the Lord can relish certain rasas, certain transcendental mellows. The mellow of separation, we were talking about that day before yesterday. How Lord Ram was relishing the taste of separation from Sita, the Vipralambha Bhava, which usually is not possible in the spiritual world. (laughs) So there are things that the Lord can do in the material world which He doesn't do in the spiritual world. For example, the killing of demons. Naturally, there are no demons in the spiritual world. But still the Lord wants to relish that So there is the material world which gives him a platform to fulfill all these desires. So similarly for Sita Ram in the spiritual world, there is no question of separation. 
So in the material world, he comes and enacts these pastimes and there is an opportunity to relish that rasa as well. So the Lord is subjected to transcendental forgetfulness by himself. He subjects himself via his pastime potency so that he can relish these leelas, these pastimes better. And also because he has come in the society of human beings, he acts like a human being, a very powerful human being undoubtedly, but he acts like another human being and most people thought of him like that. So therefore a human being is not all-knowing. A human being can also get a little confused sometimes. So also with Lord Ram, he got a little confused. Who is Vali? Who is Sugriva? They all looked identical and they were moving around so rapidly he couldn't quite understand. So this is another pastime that goes to show how the Lord acts like a human. It also increased Sugriva's anxiety and the anxiety of those who are listening to this pastime. Oh, why did the Lord do this? Why did the Lord do that? And when the Lord performs pastimes which are seen as controversial, there is also a reason for that. There are many reasons. And every incarnation of the Lord, like Krishna Leela, Ram Leela, there will invariably be some controversial pastimes. And one of the reasons for that is that the realm of devotional service to the Lord is very confidential. Access to these pastimes and the intricacies and the true understanding of these pastimes is reserved only for the faithful, not for others. And since most people are not faithful, we have these pastimes which shock or surprise the faithless and then they say, oh, how is it? How is it that the Lord can do this? How did he do that? That's not right. So they don't develop that inclination to serve the Lord. So in this way, the Lord cheats those people who don't want to surrender to him and gives them some kind of a justification, some way for them to rationalize their uh, disbelief in the Lord. So in any case, here also we see Lord Ram acting like a human. So he kills Vali. He shoots this arrow. And even as the arrow is within Vali's body, he is struck by that arrow. He sees Ram emerging from the bushes. And he reproaches him with harsh words. And he tells him, I've heard a lot about your valor and your uh, your aff affinity to dharma and how strong you are in the following of dharma but today the truth has been revealed how come you have shot an arrow at me when i am not your enemy i have not harmed you i have not harmed your citizens or your kingdom i bear no ill will towards you and there has been no cause for a conflict between you and me so why have you shot me and even then, you have shot me without informing me. You have done it like a coward from behind the bushes. And that too when I am fighting with somebody else. So there are multiple codes of conduct that you have violated. Because even Kshatriyas had codes of conduct in warfare. And Ram, as the epitome of one who follows Dharma, should have been following all of that. Vali's wife Tara had cautioned him that Ram is there, don't go. And even then, Vali had protested that I have nothing against Ram, why should Ram have anything against me? My fight is with my brother Sugriva. So Vali was speaking like this very harshly. He said, if you had challenged me to a duel, and we had, in all fairness, face to face had a combat, you would be lying here down on the floor rather than me. So then Ram admonishes him and says, My dear Sugriva, I, might, I beg your pardon, my dear Vali, monkeys are not so aware of the intricacies of dharma, but I am aware. So let me explain. 
So although I mentioned this in brief yesterday, I'd like to repeat it because this is an important topic for us. And I'd like to elaborate on this today about the justification for Lord Ram's killing of Vali. So Lord Ram said, you know, the descendants of King Ikshvaku are the authorized rulers of the entire earth planet. And they are given the responsibility and the power to ensure that people in the world follow dharma, they follow virtue, and that nobody is harassed in any way. That everybody is living peacefully and happily in accordance with dharma. And it is within their power and responsibility to reward some who follow dharma and to punish those who do not follow dharma. And the present king of the earth is Bharat. And we are under the command of Bharat. We are devoted to our duty of upholding dharma and virtue. It is in pursuance of the command of King Bharat that we are moving around and we have seen you violating this dharma. What is the dharma you have violated? You have actually violated your younger brother's wife, which is like violating your own daughter or your sister, which is a grievous sin according to dharma. And therefore that deserves punishment and the ultimate punishment of death. And we, as followers of Ikshvaku, and as representatives of King Bharat, are duty-bound to ensure that we uphold justice in this way. So Lord Ram said, you have performed this crime, and therefore what has happened to you now is just punishment. So do not lament for it. Do not be unhappy about it. Lord Ram continued to say that actually for one who violates the laws of dharma and is not punished, the suffering will be enormous. However, if a transgressor of the laws of dharma tolerates the punishment that is given to him, then he will be freed from that reactions of that sinful activity and not only that, he will be elevated to the celestial regions of the universe and maybe beyond as well. Sometimes the king may punish and sometimes the king may forgive. So if a criminal is either punished or forgiven by the right authority, not forgiven by anybody else, but the right authority, then he can become free of sin. And if a king does not so punish a criminal who has transgressed the laws of dharma, then the king shall be deemed to be sinful and he shall get the sinful reactions of that. So Lord Ram explains these intricacies of dharma. So we understand that it is always better to be punished for anything that we may have done wrong. It's, uh, it's better for us. There is this concept of mercy today. Yes, it is good to be mercy, but sometimes the idea of mercy can be misplaced or ill-conceived. Because mercy has to be seen in the context of knowledge. Mercy means something that will actually benefit the person to whom a mercy is being granted. If there is no benefit or there is lesser benefit, then what kind of mercy is that? Because people do not have today belief or faith or understanding of the principle of the soul and that there is a next life and that there is a law of karma and that according to the actions you perform, you will get reactions in, the, in a future life. So if you perform sinful activities now and you're not punished, then you will have to bear enormous suffering for these sinful actions in the future lives. Now this idea 
has no traction in the minds of people today. So they only see things from the point of view of this one life. So they say, no, 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 we don't believe about the next life and all that, just here. But actually then the criminal uh, suffers because he's arrested and put in jail. And he doubly suffers after death because anyway the sinful reactions have not been eradicated. So this is a, a subtle law. And Lord Ram is mentioning this. So my dear Vali, he says, you're supposed to be a king. A king is the upholder of dharma. The king is supposed to be uh, one who sets an example for everybody. You're supposed to be civilized and cultured. What kind of civilization and dharma is it that you have violated your own sister-in-law, your younger sister-in-law, and you are lecturing me on dharma? This is most inappropriate. Therefore, what you have got is perfectly appropriate. And if you say, my dear Vali, that, well, you can't subject me to the standards of human beings and I'm a monkey, then all right, let me say that as a Kshatriya, I am duty-bound, I am permitted by the scripture to hunt. Of course, one must remember and see this in the proper context. And hunting is a sinful activity, especially in this day and age, because we kill innocent animals. We have a farm, I'm associated with a farm project in South India, and we are in the midst of forest and we have our land. And we do have some people from, we don't know where, they come in the middle of the night in their jeeps and all that and light and they, they come to hunt animals in the night. And they create problems because then our devotees get disturbed and they, and they, they burn up the grass, long grass, which comes and burns our grass in our compound. So there's no grass left for the cows and so on. So hunting in any case is a sinful activity. So why were Kshatriyas allowed to hunt in the past? Because you see, Kshatriyas were meant to take up the sword. In other words, take up arms if there was a necessity to do so. And there would often be a need for the protection of the kingdom, of the citizens and of dharma. Violence is sometimes necessary. It's always a last resort, but <coughs> If there is no alternative, then one has to resort to violence. So the kings in the past had to become accustomed to killing. Because if they were not, if they were not trained in that, all of a sudden if they were asked to go and fight and kill other human beings, they would not be able to do that. So they were sometimes permitted to go out and get accustomed to using their, their weapons, and, and killing animals, etc. So that was the whole idea. It wasn't just um, a question of some enjoyment for some pleasure, etc. And in any case, even though they were permitted to do that, even that action was fraught with risks. We all know the fate of Dasharath Maharaj, who went out hunting and he heard what he thought was the sound of an animal, of a deer. And he shot. He was so skillful that he could shoot an arrow to the target just by hearing sound. But because he was a human, and to err is human, he made a mistake. He didn't kill an animal. That was a young boy. And he shot him and killed him. And that's how he got the curse. And that's how many things from the Ramayana unfolded. So yes, a Kshatriya is allowed to hunt, but look at the risks. Yes, a Kshatriya is allowed to gamble sometimes, but look at the risks, look at what happened to Maharaj Yudhishthir. So better in this day and age, we don't get into all that. But we are talking of a time in Treta Yuga, where this was a permitted activity. It wasn't something whimsical but it was done for this purpose. So Lord Ram says that if you say, if you argue that you are not a human being, 
and why am I subjecting you to the standards of human beings and dharma? Then all right, I say that you are a monkey and I am a kshatriya and I am permitted to hunt. And when one hunts animals, one may hunt from a hidden vantage point. And one need not be seen by the animal when one is hunting that animal. In either case, my dear Vali, you deserved punishment and you deserved to die. Now, there are many other reasons that people give for um, Lord Ram's um, killing Vali from a point behind a bush where he was not being seen by Vali. What Lord Ram has explained is the genuine reason, is the actual fact. There are, there are some, some theories that are quite popular amongst many people that Vali had obtained the benediction from the demigods that whoever he fought with the other person's strength would reduce by 50% and he would get that 50%. So if Vali fought with an opponent, the benediction was that the opponent's strength would diminish by 50% and that 50% would be added to Vali's strength. So Vali would be 150% of his own strength and the opponent would become 50% of his strength. And each time they fought, this would be there. So therefore, Vali became practically invincible. So no one could fight with him because the stronger the person, the opponent was, the stronger Vali would become because he would take 50% and the opponent would lose 50%. And if Ram had come face to face with Vali, then he, he, he would have had to uh, honor the benedictions given by the demigods. So his strength would have diminished 50% and then Vali would have increased. And so it would not have been possible for Lord Ram to kill Vali had Lord Ram accosted him face to face. And therefore Lord Ram had to do it being hidden. Now this is a popular theory. However, there is no evidence from the scripture about this fact. And therefore, we do not generally um, accept that. And I've said it just so that we may be aware of it. And even if it is true for argument's sake, well, here is the explanation. The one reason why Lord Ram, another reason why Lord Ram uh, fought, from, fought Bali in this way. The fact of the matter is that the benediction that Vali had received from his father, Indra, the king of heaven was that Indra gave him a necklace of gold and so long as he was wearing that necklace of gold he could not be killed. So at that time when Vali was fighting with Sugriva he was wearing that necklace of gold so even though the arrow of Lord Ram had struck him and he was lying on the ground completely injured unable to do anything in great pain but still, he wasn't dead. And we'll see a little later, then finally, he gives that gold necklace to Sugriva, and then he dies. So when Lord Ram um, came here, and he killed Vali, Vali began to repent. He understood what Lord Ram was saying. And he actually agreed with Lord Ram. And he said, oh Ram, what you are saying is correct. I completely agree with you. Actually, I deserve this punishment. It is a fact that I have committed a greatly sinful act by taking away the wife of my younger brother as my own wife and, and I have banished him from the kingdom. It is only because of my pride, my arrogance and my ignorance that this fate has befallen me. So the action that you have done by killing me in this manner is perfectly justified. Please, henceforth, my request to you is to protect my dear son, Angad. Angad is only a young boy. 
and he will be grief stricken upon learning of my death so please protect him o ram ram promises protection to angad and before we go further another question that may be asked is that ram entered into a pact of friendship with sugriva sugriva had no army he had only a few monkeys with him vali had the whole monkey army with him plus vali himself was extraordinarily powerful you will remember that yesterday i mentioned a small pastime that is there in the uttarakhanda of the ramayan wherein it is described that vali was so powerful that once when ravana tried to attack him vali just caught hold of ravana's head and neck under his armpit and he held him there while he finished all his rituals in the four corners of the earth and the four uh, oceans and ravana was so impressed and he was dazed by the time this was over he offered his hand of friendship so vali not only had the army he was also personally strong very strong stronger than sugriva stronger than ravana even and if vali had wanted he could have got sita back from lanka in a day there's no doubt about it so why did lord ram not go to vali Why did he make a pact of friendship with Sugriva? This is an interesting question. Now the first answer to that is that had Lord Ram made a pact of friendship with Vali, Vali could would certainly have been able to fulfill the Lord's purpose of getting Sita back, but it would not have served the purpose of justice to Sugriva. and his wife ruma so how could that supreme lord who has come to establish dharma and to and to ensure justice for everyone just for his own purpose for his own sake of getting his wife back ignore the injustice that had been meted out to sugriva and his wife so that is one important reason why lord ram did not side with vali rather he took sugriva's side also this was the intention of the demigods which is why if you remember from yesterday's discussion that the sage kabandha not the sage the the demon kabandha after he had been cremated he assumed his reassumed his heavenly body and he asked lord ram to go to kishkindha to pampa sarovar and then further on to rishimukh mountain and enter into a friendship with sugriva who would help him to achieve his objective so this was also the purposes of purpose of the demigods the demigods had this plan because ultimately the lord descends or at least one of the reasons for the lord's descent is to fulfill the desires of the demigods when the earth is overburdened with demoniac forces the demigods go to the lord and request him to advent and destroy the demoniac forces so the demigods had arranged for this to happen thirdly lord ram doesn't come only for himself he also comes for his devotees and he wants to engage his innumerable devotees in his service he wants to create opportunities for them to serve him so therefore now that he engaged sugriva and then he um conquered uh, or he defeated vali and then the entire army was at his disposal he had hanuman he had sugriva etc so everyone was engaged in his service and finally lord ram was acting as a human being and as a human being the lord did not want to display too often his omnipotence so the lord the lord doesn't need anybody's help he is swarat he can independently just by his mere thought accom- accomplish his every objective but because he was playing the role of a human he had to show that he was dependent on other people to do this 
and therefore he had to have his devotees and so on. So Lord Ram did not approach Vali and also Vali had to have his punishment and this was the Lord's mercy on Vali. Sometimes the Lord's mercy comes in the form of saving somebody's life and sometimes the Lord's mercy comes in the form of taking away somebody's life. Because the Lord is absolute, in both cases the Lord bestows His mercy. This is a very important point. On the absolute platform, there is no difference between killing and saving. Because the Lord being the all-knowing, uh, absolute truth is, is perfect in His love, perfect in His wisdom, perfect in His mercy, and everything He does is always for the benefit of the person on whom He wants to bestow mercy, either by killing or by saving. So these are the reasons, because Vali had to be punished now. If he wasn't punished now, he would greatly suffer later. So anyway, coming back to the story of Vali's transformation. Now this is rather remarkable. For somebody who was reproaching Lord Ram uh, with so much vigor, and after hearing Lord, the Lord's explanation, he completely changed. And he said, yes, Lord Ram, you are completely right. It was my mistake. I was very offensive and sinful. And what you have done is right. Now, after he did that, after he spoke to Lord Ram, by which time uh, the word had spread inside the palace, and Vali's wife came running. Her name was Tara. And she came running to see her husband fallen. And she started wailing in grief. And gradually, the other ministers and the others, they all came running out of the palace. And when they saw Lord Ram there, they fled in fear. And Tara called out to them and said, Where are you running away? Come here and see your Lord and Master is lying here about to die. They said, No, no, Tara, you come back. Don't go there. Ram is very powerful. Now you come within the fortifications of Kish Kishkindha, our kingdom. Your duty now is to anoint your son Angad as the king. So you come here, but Tara was in no position to listen. She said, I just want to be with my husband. So she went there and she was mourning and wailing in grief. And when Sugriva saw Tara's lamentation, his heart was also broken. And he realized, what have I done? Just from myself, I have caused so much grief. I have had my elder brother killed. And just see how his widows are grieving. So he developed a, a complete disgust for what had happened. And he, he spoke to Lord Ram and said, Ram, I am not keen on, on this kingdom at all. You know, I, 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 I am completely averse to it now. The very thought of it is disgusting to me. Just see how strange it is, O Lord Ram. I have fulfilled my desire. But upon the fulfillment of my desire, what I get is not happiness but disgust. Because at what cost should I enjoy this kingdom? A very important practical fact of this world. We many times act to fulfill our desires, our long-cherished desires. Many times we don't obtain them, and sometimes we obtain them. So after long struggle, we obtain our cherished desires, and lo and behold, what happens? The result is something different. We expected so much happiness from this marriage. My God, what happened? <laughs> We were dreaming of a nice, beautiful world and we, everything would be so nice and, and finally we got married and we attained our cherished objective. This was an ideal romance if ever there was one and, and my God, what's happened now? I attained my cherished objective but what I've received is not, not what I anticipated. 
That's the nature of this world. It happens again and again and again in everything we do. We have some desire. We struggle hard, commit so many sinful acts perhaps in the process. And we may even get what we want, but when we get it, we're not happy anymore. There's dissatisfaction. And then we try something else. We struggle to get that in the hope that we will get happiness. And if we succeed eventually in getting that, still the charms wear off. We're no longer happy. So the fulfilling our desires is not a guarantee to happiness in this world. A very, very important point. So we must, we must see what are the right kinds of desires that we should have, first of all. If those desires are in connection with the Lord and His unalloyed pure service, then yes, these desires will ultimately be fulfilled and they, this fulfillment will yield to real happiness. Otherwise, no. So Sugriva was lamenting. Tara was also lamenting that I don't want to live. O oh, Ram, you please kill me. And if you think that you can't kill a woman, then understand that it just I am I'm the other half of Vali. So Lord Ram consoled her. Meanwhile, Vali, he was still alive. He was in great pain. After having spoken to Ram, he now turned to Sugriva. And he told Sugriva, My dear brother, I have committed a great injustice against you. There was a great misunderstanding which I did not understand. Now, please forgive me for all that I have done, the harsh behavior of mine towards you, the injustice that I have done towards you. Please take charge of this kingdom after me. And please protect my son Angad as your own. And Sugriva uh, and Vali then took off that necklace of gold that he had received from Indra and he, he gave it to Sugriva. And that was when now he was ready to die. It's interesting what would have happened had Vali not uh, agreed to Ram's idea. Or what if Vali had still felt that what Ram had done was unjust or wrong or adharmic. Very interesting hypothetical possibility. But that wouldn't have happened. Why? Because you see, Vali was not a demon. Ravana was a demon. Vali was behaving like a person who is completely engrossed in sense gratification, which he was. But he was a son, he was the son of Indra, mind you. He was not an ordinary demon. And so there was that, uh, you know, that, that divine trait in him. He just got carried away with power. He got carried away with the facilities for sense enjoyment. He was so strong. So therefore, when one has all these material qualifications, it is very difficult to remain humble and devotional. Even a, a pauper is proud of his penny, so goes the proverb. So if someone has even one penny, he still feels proud. I have one penny, the other one doesn't even have one penny. So what to speak of one who has so much? So Vali was just basically misled and he had become proud and arrogant, but he basically wasn't a bad guy. <laughs> He had committed a great sin by kidnapping and taking away Sugriva's wife, but it was his own ego, his own arrogance. But once he came face to face with the Lord and he was punished by the Lord, he came to his senses. And he understood, oh my God, I have made such a big blunder. I committed such a big sin. That is the difference between demons and devotees. Devotees may also sometimes get puffed up with pride. They may also sometimes commit very great offenses against the Lord and his devotees. Indra has done it. 
Many of the demigods have done it. As devotees, sometimes we see this, perhaps we experience it in our own life. Devotees may sometimes get in, puffed up, they may get proud, they may behave in inappropriate ways. But gradually, devotees, they come back to their senses, especially when they're given good instruction. Then they, they, they come back to normal. Whereas a demoniac person never learns from good instruction, like Duryodhana. Duryodhana was instructed so many times by so many of his elderly uh, relatives and his gurus, his own father Bhishma, his mother Gandhari, Vyasadeva, Sanjaya, uh, Bhishma, Dronacharya, Kripacharya, everyone tried to drill some sense into Duryodhana's brain but he would not listen. So that is a demoniac person. Similarly, Ravana would not listen. His wife Mandodari tried so many times. Kumbhakarna tried. Yes, even Kumbhakarna tried. So many tried, but they could not because he was fundamentally a demon. Whereas Vali's nature was different. He had got carried away with his power and his sense enjoyment. So even devotees may sometimes do ghastly things, you know, but still there's a change. There's an interesting comment which one Acharya made one time, I don't remember now which Acharya said it. He said, why are there demons in this world? It would be so nice if there were only demigods. Demigods and then us people here living on the earth. And the answer is that if there were no demons, the demigods would become like demons. Because it is the fear of the demons that keeps the demigods in check. When the demons come to attack, the, de the demigods take shelter of the Supreme Lord. Otherwise, the demons get carried, the demigods get carried away by their own pride, their own opulence, their own position, their prestige. It happens with Indra. He offended his guru Brihaspati and he, he was cursed to um, be born uh, as a hog. So there were so many such examples in the scripture. So the demigods, they do commit mistakes, just as the devotees also commit mistakes sometimes, especially if they're not pure devotees. But the demons, they don't rectify themselves. See, here is an important point of consideration. Also, further, just consider the fortune of Bali Maharaj. I beg your pardon, of Vali. Bali Maharaj, of course, is fortunate. He's another personality. Of Vali. Vali left his body. He died in the presence of Lord Ramachandra. What can be more auspicious than passing away from this world in the presence of the Lord, face to face with the Lord? One of the uh, qualities of the Lord, as mentioned by Srila Rupa Goswami in the Nectar of Devotion is, Hatari Gati Dayakaha. Hatari Gati Dayakaha, hata, hata means to kill, Ari means the enemy. Dayaka means one who gives. So one who gives a gati, a higher destination, after killing somebody, that is one of the qualities of the Lord. So whoever the Lord kills, he grants him at the very least a higher destination within the universe. And in some cases, well, that he may even give liberation and they may go back to the spiritual world. Sometimes they may merge into the impersonal Brahman. In either case, there is a higher destination that the person killed by the Lord attains. So therefore, how is it possible that there was anything inauspicious about the death of Vali? He was personally killed by Lord Ramachandra with his own hands. And also he died in the presence of Lord Ram, right looking at the lotus face of the Lord. So such a fortunate and auspicious passing away. Srila Prabhupada mentions 
that all the people who were the warriors who were fighting the battle of Kurukshetra, everyone who saw Lord Krishna and who died in Krishna's presence, and even those who were killed by Arjuna because Arjuna was a, the Lord's pure devotee and he was fighting on behalf of the Lord and following his instructions. So all these people were delivered. And so was um, Vali. So there was nothing inauspicious. And before he passed away, Vali also spoke to his son Angad and said, My dear Angad, now you please take shelter of your uncle, Sugriva. Do not associate with anyone who is not favorable to Sugriva. And you obey him and, and serve him nicely. He also told Sugriva, please look after Angad. And Angad was, was very tearful. Tara, his mother, asked him to fall at his father's feet and he fell at his father's feet in, in offering his gratitude to his father. And then Vali departed from this world, looking at the lotus face of Lord Ramachandra. The Supreme Lord can do anything. He can give justice, he can, he can give the results of people's actions, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly. Kartum akartum anyatha kartum samarthaha saha ishwaraha. Srila Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur has said that the Supreme Lord Ishwaraha is samarthaha, he is fully capable. He can do kartum, he may do whatever he likes. Akartum, he may not do whatever he likes. And anyatha kartum, he may do something differently if he likes. Whatever he likes, he can do or he cannot do. Who is to stop him? So if the Lord wants to give the results of somebody's karma directly by himself, he can do it, kartum. If he wants to forgive somebody and take away all that karma and not give the reaction, he can do it. Anyatha kartum, or he can do it, he can give the reaction of that person's karma through somebody else or through material nature. So he is the Supreme Lord, so who can uh, protest or who can uh, stop the Lord from doing that? So in any case, here we see um, the deliverance of Vali by Lord Ramachandra. So it is a lesson for us that we can also accept um, proper reactions of our karma in our life in the right spirit without protesting, without complaining, without blaming others. As we see in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Tatte nu kampam susamikshamanu bhunjana evatma kritam vipakam ridvagvapur bhir vidadhan namaste jiveta yo mukti padesa daya bhag this is a prayer of Lord Brahma to the Lord, to Lord Krishna. My dear Lord, anyone who whilst enduring suffering and misery in this world does not complain and understands that this suffering is merely because of his sinful actions that he has performed previously and he simply patiently expects your mercy and all the while with his heart, rid, with his words, vak, and with his body, bapuhu, he continues to offer his obeisances to you and serve you. Such a person will be entitled to perfection of life. Ji veta yo mukti pade sadaya bhak. Shri Shri Radha Gokulanand ki jai, Shri Shri Sita Ram Lakshman Hanuman ki jai, Shri Shri Gaur Nitai ki jai. So therefore, when we also experience misery in our life, we can understand that there is no need to blame others for it. 
we accept this as past of part of our own karma. So in any case, now the after passing away of um, Vali, Sugriva was mourning and he didn't want to become king. And he said that, uh, let the other monkeys search for Sita or Ram, I want to enter into fire. So Lord Ram consoled him and said, uh, Sugriva, your tears of sorrow are sufficient bereavement for the departure of the soul of your brother from his body. Now that you have bereaved, now you get on with your responsibilities. Now the time has come. The entire material world is running under the control of time. Destiny and time are supreme in this world, O Sugriva. And so also with us. We also undergo so many miseries. Sometimes there is some loss. Sometimes there is uh, some sorrow. So yes, being human beings, we will be afflicted with sorrow because of some problems. We may be sometimes very happy because of some apparently good thing that has happened. But we shouldn't remain lamenting or rejoicing at material things. We may rejoice or lament for a while, but we should get on with our job, get on with our life and continue our service to Krishna. One devotee was mentioning in one lecture, a very nice point, that there is a famous football coach. And he tells his um, people in his team, when they win a match, or win a major cup, like a World Cup or this or that, some major thing, a major victory. Or if they have lost that match and lost the cup, he gives them 24 hours to rejoice or to grieve. Do whatever you like for 24 hours. If you won, do anything you like. If you have lost, do anything you like. But after 24 hours, get back to business. Get back to your training. Now back to the field and start. So yes, as human beings, you know, we also feel sorrowful and we become elated sometimes. Okay, for some time, do it. Get back. Get back to your devotional service. Get back to life again. So and nothing is ever achieved by one who continues to, to give vent to sorrow and lamentation. So one has to move on in one's life. So in any case, um, now the cremation had to take place. So Sugriva arranged everything for the cremation of Vali on the banks of Tungapatra River, another very holy river. And Lord Ram said to Hanuman and Lakshman, I cannot go into Kishkindha because the vow that I have taken is that I will be in exile. So in these 14 years, I cannot enter into any city. I have to be in the forest. So Hanuman, Lakshman, you go ahead for the coronation. So then at that time, Sugriva is coronated as the king of Kishkindha. And Ram also instructs that Angad, the son of Vali, should be the crown prince. And that happens. And then after that, because the rainy season, the monsoon has begun, Lord Ram says, it's not the right time to go out searching for Sita. Therefore, let all the monkey chiefs reside here in the forest of Kishkindha for four months. And once the rainy season is over and autumn has come, then we will resume our search for Sita. So now Sugriva has attained his objective. He has got his kingdom, he has got his wife, and he immerses himself in the royal pleasures of life. And after the monsoon season is over, during which Lord Ram continued to lament, he was feeling intense separation from his wife Sita Devi. And at the end of it, Sugriva continued to remain immersed in sensual pleasures. And he seemed to have forgotten his promise to Ram. He had, Ram had fulfilled his side of the pact. 
But Sugriva was now supposed to fulfill his part of the agreement. But Sugriva seemed to have forgotten. So Ram just mentioned to, to Lakshman that it appears in great grief he mentioned that. Lakshman understood this. He became furious. With red eyes he approached Kishkindha. When the monkeys of Kishkindha saw Lakshman walking towards Kishkindha in that angry mood, they were terrified. Sugriva was also terrified. Lakshman walked right into the palace and into the inner chambers of Sugriva, where Sugriva was uh, engrossed in various types of sensual pleasures. And he said, you dare to have broken your promise? You have achieved. Now just, you have achieved your purpose. And now you have forgotten to, to undertake your part of the agreement. And Lakshman was so angry, it seemed as if he would destroy the whole universe. And Sugriva was terrified. And he came to his senses. And he said, yes, 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 I will do the needful, I will do the needful. And then, uh, under Lakshman's superintendence, uh, Sugriva gave orders. He called all the monkey army, all the monkey soldiers together and sent them out in different groups to search for Sita in different directions. So here we see that Sugriva was wanting in gratitude. He had forgotten because he also got carried away by his royal luxury. He forgot what he was supposed to do. He had to be sternly reminded then he also came to his senses. Such is the nature of opulence and material enjoyment. It can make one forget one's duties. It can make one ungrateful. Sugriva was not exactly ungrateful, it's just that he forgot being so absorbed in the royal luxuries. But he had to express his gratitude. And that should not have come by threats from Lakshman. He should have realized himself. So again, a lesson for all of us, that when we get material success, material opulence, material pleasures, we should not forget our gratitude to the Lord and to the devotees. When we have attained something that we want from the Lord or from anyone, we should not forget our responsibility and duty and our gratitude towards those people, especially towards the Lord. So anyway, now Sugriva got into action. Sometimes we need that jolt. So somebody comes and gives us the jolt and we wake up and say, yes, yes, now I must do my duty. So Sugriva got into action and all the monkey soldiers went in different directions, searching for Sita. And eventually, of course, as we all know, Hanuman was successful thanks to the directions given by Jatayu's brother, Sampati. And one final word that I want to say uh, is that there are some people, again, another theory that many people believe in, that Vali got reincarnated as the hunter Jara. You see, when Lord Krishna was in Dwarka and he had engineered, so to speak, the passing away and the disappearance of the entire Yadu dynasty, he was preparing for his own disappearance from the world because he had fulfilled his mission. So there was no reason for him to continue to stay. Now the Lord's appearance and disappearance are always transcendental. But for the sake of the faithless, as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, sometimes the Lord arranges certain pastimes in a way that casts doubt in the minds of the faithless. So there is this popular story that has its origins in the Mahabharata about a hunter called Jara. He wanted to shoot a deer and he mistook the lotus toes of, of uh, Krishna as the deer and he shot an arrow and then some people say that Lord, that caused Lord Krishna's death. Of course they don't understand that Lord Krishna doesn't die, neither is he born. He's always transcendentally existing, whether in the spiritual world or in the material world. 
So people say that because Ram unjustly killed Vali, so by the laws of karma, the tables were reversed. And then Vali became Jara, the hunter. And when Lord Ram appeared in Dwapar Yuga as Krishna, then there was a reversal. Now it was Jara who killed Krishna. But that is not a fact, of course. The, yes, there was a hunter that is there. Madhvacharya says that this hunter was actually Bhrigu Rishi. And there's a whole pastime with that. We don't have time to talk about that. But Vali, why would he be reborn? He got the perfect death. He was killed by the Lord. He, he passed away facing the lotus face, face of the Lord. So he did not get reborn as Jara. So that is also another mistaken notion that people have. So anyway, there are many lessons to learn um, from the pastime of uh, Lord Ramachandra killing Vali and installing Sugriva on the throne. Shri Sita Ram Lakshman Hanuman ki jai. Shri Shri Radha Gokulanand ki jai. Shri Shri Gaur Nitai ki jai. Shri La Prabhupada ki jai. Gaur Premanande. Hare Krishna. Sorry, I think we don't have time for questions now. So we'll wind up. I, and tomorrow is Ram Navami, so please try to come to the temple in the morning if you can, certainly. And then the timings for Abhishek, etc. Attend that. And we'll also be meeting in the evening tomorrow, I think, isn't it? Yes. Okay, Sri Ram Navami Mahotsavaki Jai. Hare Krishna. Thank you.